Well, I did some calculations recently, and I realized that we are in month 40 or 41 of this thing they call a, uh, a show. I think. Wow. It's a lot. I, that's all I have to say. I was just thinking about it the other day. I was like, mm. okay, like, because you know when you changed the website a couple years ago? I guess it was last year. And it went from like 20, 21, 22. Oh, and right, right, right. Years. And I was like, oh, wow, we've had a whole year since then. So we're yeah. actually in three now. And then I had to like think back to like third grade math. And I was like, 20, 21. 22 23 okay so that's three years we started in march that's really like april yeah so put all that together um so 40 months of this we know the statistics say like seven is the one that most people don't get to and then 28 months or so or 28 episodes mm. is i think the next step of that right so we're defying the odds and then you see someone like well, your boy, uh, Jason Calacanis, is probably in the 2000s for some of them. You see someone like a Joe Rogan in the 1500s, and you're just like, wow, like, that's Dude, swap. that's, yeah. They're at it a long, long time. Yeah. Well, I think Rogan's, like, in his second or third decade at this point, it seems like. But, yeah, you know, when we're talking about frequency and having things going for a long time, I, I think that's something that um, today's guest has learned a lot about in business for – I think over a decade now, um, I met her somewhere in the middle of that, I believe. Mm -hmm. I think maybe 2016-ish time frame. Um, her name is Carrie Locke, the lady behind the Happy Hour Hostess, mm -hmm. which is an interesting name. Mm -hmm. I remember like way back when that was, well, welcome to the show. Thank you. Um, you... What do you do and does that how how does that name fit into what do you do today? And like did you ever like really make a real conscious effort to maybe we shouldn't do that? Like it's because name changes are always weird. Tim just did a rebrand of mm -hmm. Start Wheel into Innovate Hampton Roads, and that had been around for what six, seven. I mean, it's such an interesting thing when someone knows you or people know you for, for so long as one thing, mm -hmm. and then you start thinking, should I do this other? Yeah. Like it's I, I'm I'm just interested in and where you are on that. Cause I know at one point you were thinking about doing it. And so who are you? What, what's, what's the happy hour hostess? And did you ever think about the old change -a -roo? Yeah. Every single day. I still oh, still. Think about it every <laughs> single day. So thanks for starting there. No. Um, okay. So happy hour hostess is um, a professional event planning company. We are based in Virginia beach and um, our office is in Haygood. We do a lot of weddings and we also do corporate and social. So um, weddings are really our bread and butter, uh, but we do love, um, you know, a big birthday party or corporate event for sure. We uh, really enjoy that as well. Um, do you want to know more about the company or do you want me to move yeah, into the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the name? Okay. Tell so, us about the company. Right. So there are three of us that work here full time. Uh, we have two other event planners that are excellent, outstanding um, planners in their own right. I just don't have five full-time jobs and it works out really well for both of them because it, they kind of, they fit the events that they're assigned to within their own jobs. And they kind of come in and out of the office um, on their own schedule. One of them's here right now. Um, and then we have a slew of event assistants who have their own lives and jobs. And then they meet up with us on the weekends to help um, back us up and produce those events. So I think another thing about our staffing that's important to our success is that we also back each other up. So we don't have teams uh, within the company. It's not like with events that I run, I always have these two with my assistant. Um, the girls who work here full time are frequently with me. I back people up. We all back people up so that we keep our same standards super high and there can't be like a space for bad habits that falls into it. So um, as a company, we are like obsessed with what I always call event excellence. And um, that's kind of our mantra behind the scenes, but event excellence to us doesn't necessarily mean that like every event is ready for Vogue magazine, right? Like it's not necessarily about the actual design and decor being um, amazing, even though we're really into that. It's just about the way that you experience working with us 
should feel good to you. Like we should know how to talk intelligently about budgets and flow and production. And we should know how to make your event design better than it would have if we weren't in there. Um, we should be great at communication. This is a service-based business. We take that super seriously. Um, we try to really stay up on top of our um, turnaround times and um, communication on just the way that we take care of our clients and the other vendors is just, it all like sort of wraps into um, what we're trying to do here. So I don't know. I could keep going for another hour if you want to just let me talk about how your hostess, but I feel like that's probably not how you want this podcast to go. <laughs> no, I, I was going to circle back around about the whole branding aspect. And yeah. it's one of those things that you never know how it's everyone. You try so hard to get established that brand. And then you never know how much that brand is stuck until you actually rebrand. And then everyone knows you for what you want them to forget about you. It's just, it's, so if you decide to rebrand, just, just keep that in mind. Yeah. It's really, you know, what's interesting as you guys are saying this, I didn't even think about it. You know, when we first started, we were, I, I get, or when I first started the whole hatch Norfolk, it was, it wasn't hatch, it was hatch Norfolk. And so yeah. it would tick me off all the time because people were like, you're just so focused on Norfolk. And I was like, no, I'm not. It just happened to be the domain that was available. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's what I bought because I wasn't spending $15,000 on hatch.com. If yeah. you know, it might have even been more than that. And then we finally moved over to st start with Hatch, which wasn't really a brand yeah. change. It was more of a URL change. But like, man, it like people, you're right, Tim, people tie you into that stuff. And it's it's very annoying when it's just like, yo, that's totally not what we are. But yeah, I'm glad you it's, think it's that. Zap, Zach, is, is Triple H, is that is that a wrestler? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that until I met Jack, until I met Zach years ago. That What's Triple H? H? Why would you know that? What like? Because half your hostess is H H H. Oh yes. Well, you have someone that's more famous than you. I apologize. I know. Well, <laughs> I also have to say that um, Zach, do you remember the first conversation you and I ever had? Because I do. I, what do you tell me? I probably will. <laughs> okay, this is how it went. Zach, hi. Um, I'm sure there was some Netflix question involved, right? But then it was, uh, what you know? What do you do? Me. I'm a wedding planner. Zach says, I hate weddings. <laughs> Period. Stop talking. <laughs> that, that, that does not sound like Zach at all. I, I, His exact feedback. I hate weddings. <laughs> I was probably planning mine at the time. That's why I said it. Which is funny because like, I didn't plan a damn thing about my wedding. My wife did. And I'm not forcing you into weddings. <laughs> like, that is well, I was, so if you ask the, the groom how much they uh, are involved with wedding yeah. planning, mm. I, was, I, I learned over the weekend that the answer should be 30%. Because no one is going to argue against 30%. So, Zach, you probably help 30%. Who made up that number? That's funny. I wonder where that came from. 30 seems very high. Well, but, but 30, it's like high enough that no, no one's going to argue that you did less. But it's still enough that to say that you contribute. I, I heard it on a podcast, on the All In podcast uh, over the weekend. Okay. I'll well, put that in my docs. We expect 30% <laughs> of grooms. No. We well, never force grooms into anything. If, they don't want to be a part of it. I think it's fine. I just need them at the last meeting. So we all are on the same page. Well, thank you for bringing up my Netflix question. You know, I always mm -hmm. appreciate people remembering that. Mm -hmm. That's always good. Um, in that kind of vertical, what's your favorite wedding related TV show? Oh, um, I love Indian matchmaking. Um, Four weddings. I used to have to watch that. Mar marriage, marriage. There's marriage your thing. 30, there's your 30, uh, your 30% Tim. I had to watch wedding TV shows way back. Mm -hmm. Four weddings is terrible. That's probably why you hate weddings. That is not a good show. See? Yeah. There we go. So you count, do you consider like the um the trash TV about weddings as wedding TV? Like, oh, I got married at first sight. Like, I don't know. I just don't know. I just like they put you guys in such a bad like situation in that, like, oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know. I don't I've never seen any of them. Please don't ever start. Yeah. <laughs> Like succession or nothing for me. That's like my only show wow. right now. Mm. Have you finished? No. I'm, almost, I'm like halfway through season four. I'll get there. Oh, you're season. almost done then. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Wait, wait, so I didn't really wait. address the name. Do you want me to do it? Do you want me to talk about the name? No, I would. I mean, not unless you really want to, but I, it was just really more the fact of you'll never know how much your brand has been established until you change your brand. But like, in what way are you saying that? Are you saying that as like a warning or or like an opening up of what it could be on the other side? 
You know what I mean? Is this uh, a no, I guess more, like a, yeah, no, more minutes. is a, more is a warning. It, uh, yeah. it just, it, it's just, it's so, it's goofy. Yeah. I would, I would envision just from the outside world, it may be holding you back a little bit when someone right. sees it. Right. And I, I'm sure that's something, a conversation that we've had in the past. Right. Right. Where it's just like, okay, like she does some happy hours, whatever, but like, what would it brand to, you know, whatever events, you know, carries events, you know? Right. I, yeah. And so like, it's just, but then you don't want to be just weddings because then the corporate stuff get like, so maybe it doesn't matter. I mean, but obviously te you are over 10 years old now, right? 10. We turned 10 in March. Yeah. Yeah. That's what wow. I'm mm -hmm. Thanks. So, I mean, there's 10 years of branding behind that, sure. um, but there's a huge brand, um, brand switcheroo rebrand right now with Twitter and X. And so there is, you could that's make right. the argument that, uh, mm -hmm. that when companies do that, there's people talking about it. So it's not mm -hmm. necessarily a bad thing. It's yeah, but it's how, how long, how many, what, what do you, what's the over under a number of years is going to take someone to no longer reference tweeting versus Xing. Is that what I mean, they're calling like, it? Xing? Well, Xing this? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's like the soft answer. I mean, I don't know if there's been any thing official, but I mean, but people mm. that, that will last for years. I hope it becomes Xeroxing. I prefer Xeroxing. I'm going to Xerox. This is my Xerox. Perhaps. Tim's I have like a new different company. branding plan in my head that I'm hoping to kind of get my head and feet underneath of, which is I think what we need to do at this point is not leave Happier Hostess, but split the brand. Mm. So um, Happier Hostess does have a reputation that I'm really proud of and all of my team is really proud of um, in this market. And I, it's impossible to say that it hasn't held us back, but I am pleased with how it, far it's taken us, if that makes sense. Um, I think that where it might stop us is getting out of this market where no one has been like warmed up to the name at this point. So I think that as we expand Happier Hostess and grow into even a more luxury and ultra luxury space, um, I'm going to probably split the brand into a secondary uh, brand that will be able to handle like a destination ultra luxury client um, and leave Happier Hostess here to continue to serve the local and regional market in a really excellent way. Um, and I think that's right now what I am aiming to do. Well, that's because you've been out there hitting the pavement, letting people know who you are over yeah. all these years, doing all those hundred, hundreds of events, thousands of right. events, probably. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. What do you think about that? You guys are yeah. good I, at this. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. make make that arm there and then advertise from a a non-local perspective. Hey, here's this other stuff with some fancy, pretty name that maybe you made right. up like the wallpaper um i don't know but um no it wouldn't be the wallpaper but you know something in there you know that luxury aspect i didn't even know ultra luxury was a thing until today so thank you for teaching me that um is, is ultra luxury the highest of the high yeah so um in the event space your like luxury client is considered like a overall budget price of like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to basically like around a million. And so the ultra luxury are the $1 million and up, maybe even like 750. It kind of depends on, I think where you are and like what that money can do for you at that time. Wow. What kind of so events? How, how, wow. That's what I want to see. It was like, is this like a, uh, like three to five day type of thing where you're yeah. off in Italy? Like the whole, I mean, they do it in the United States all the time. You know, like there are a million dollar weddings. I think that if you, um, are really into the event space and maybe you're one of our, you know, best clients right now, and you're watching Instagram and you're um, pulling event inspiration, they're pulling them from one to $3 million events consistently, maybe more. So um, that they're out there and they're happening all the time. So, and in the United States and in Italy. So France. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wasn't the, so um, wasn't the owner of, the 76ers, he also owns um, Fanatics. Didn't he just have a birthday party? I'm sure it was one of those multi million. It was probably an ultra luxury Where was party. That? Oh, gosh, somewhere. You, I'm sure you saw yeah. the, the well, And I'm embarrassed to say, I, and I did not finish it, but the whole, I, I don't know what Kardashian married uh, Travis Barker in Italy that was on Hulu. 
Oh. That uh, I would assume that that was Learned two things fits, today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fits mm -hmm. in that category. Probably. Yeah, what, they, 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 and it's on Hulu. Yeah, I mean they had to helicopter everything in and like lower. Like mm -hmm. I mean, it's just ridiculous. I know. I love those kinds of logistics. I like it being hard like that. So. So that's yeah. So what is your uh, what, what's your Goldilocks type of client or event? Like what's when you meet with someone for the, for the first time, this is exactly what I'm looking for. I think that our um, like ideal client is uh, probably over the age of 30. Like this is like obviously, you know, this is not exclusive, but you were if you were going to say to me, like, draw out like your yeah. ideal client avatar, right? Like an, as an exercise, um, probably couple over the age of 30 that's established, uh, educated, you know, with their own careers and um, probably knows a enough about um, what's nice and, you know, maybe has great shopping taste and knows a little bit about design and is too busy to plan their own wedding. Um, sometimes uh, you find people that are capable of doing it and they are just too busy to do it. And then sometimes that's sort of like our favorite person because we can communicate easily and sort of show options. And, um, and then they trust us to bring them the best options and we kind of elevate the experience um, from the beginning. I don't, yeah, have I, any, I don't have any style. So, I mean, that went all over my head. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I'm, I, yeah, I get that just in the sense yeah. of, I'm sure there's some people that are like, yeah, I want a luxury type event. And then you right. start throwing numbers at them and they're like, eh, I guess I didn't really know what the true definition was. Yeah. And it's okay. Like, I mean, I don't know how many clients come to us knowing how much things cost. People don't know. And it's, that's sure. a big part of my job is not being afraid to talk about numbers and uh, educating about what the value of certain things is and, you know, and everyone's event is different. And so one thing that we are really good at is managing the budget. So when we talk in the beginning about how much are you looking to spend? Um, and then we kind of put that into an initial budget allocation to say, oh, and then there are conversations after that, how much do you want to spend about like, what's more important to you, maybe the flowers or the lighting? Or do you love a great band? Or do you love a great photographer? Like, um, we kind of have each person uh, help us rank that so that when we sit down to allocate their budget, it is done in a way that reflects what's important to them. But, you know, a lot of the times we can start with that number, but then when we start to put the number into the budget, it is almost always, you know, a follow-up call or Zoom to like talk about what you described to me that you want is not actually like reflected in this column. And this is what we would need this column to say hey, to reflect what you're the images that you're sending to me. So, so when you hear as a novice in this, mm -hmm. Tim, I'm, I'm sure you're a novice in this too. But when you hear like, oh, the average wedding in the Washington DC yeah. is oh, way over six figures, then you hear like maybe here it's in the 30, 40, 50 yeah. is the is the average. Obviously, that area is is a higher. I don't know, median income type of thing than here. Is that simply just the reason why it's a more expensive wedding? Is it people like what makes an area have a well, way more? And I know that's a, it's a ridiculous yeah. question to ask, but what makes an area hard, um, have higher average wedding cost compared to, you know, something to hear? So I think that it's just different challenges no matter the market. And I think that, yes, like probably just the cost of living in DC, like probably drives up some of what's happening in that space. Right. And then in honestly, like if you wanted to get into it in DC, you're working in there in like the city environment where a lot of the events are in museums. So you can't start until the museum is closed. So you have a much tighter setup time, um, no matter what logistics are more difficult about load in and load out and um, you have to pay for that, right? So if we have to do something faster, we need more staff in every single department. And so it just drives up the price, right? So that is probably a part of it. But then I would ha also argue that there are things about living in this market that are more expensive, which is that a lot of the things that if anyone watches our Instagram, like a lot of the rentals that we are showing they're not necessarily all coming from our local market. Um, we have some amazing rental companies here that we are super loyal to and 
live in appreciation of constantly. But then, you know, we are very frequently going to Richmond and then going into that DC, Maryland um, space. We rented from North Carolina and, um, you know, we have certain things that are mailed in all the time um, just because there is a finite amount of rental availability here in the area where I think that if you live in a bigger city, that is not as like, you're not paying for all of that travel. Right. So I think the money shows up in different ways in, in different cities, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So when you're planning events, like, do you have uh, a, like a menu for, per se? And you're like, these are the, you know, this is this category, this category, this category, or do people normally come to you and say, I want this. And then you have to go out and find it. Okay, are you saying like as far as who we would hire for each category? Oh, like, or just like the just the rental equipment itself? Okay. Uh, no, not the answer to like the menu question is essentially yeah. no. So uh, if we are doing like a private estate wedding, let's just say uh, in a Richmond suburb, right? Or even here in uh, Virginia Beach or Norfolk, um, you have to start with the logistics. So obviously like that just depends on a site visit and um, feasibility site visit to see like, where can we put the tents? And, you know, can, can we stake in this ground? Or are we starting to get into where like the wire, the underground, you know, power cables are and, um, you know, where can we put the restrooms? And it all just starts with logistics. And then that sort of feeds where we can go from there. But um, a lot of those events are all just individual. I mean, it was, I, I, that was one of the things that I, like when we were at something in the water, I was just amazed oh, yeah. at just the, the logistics mm -hmm. behind trying to have all that work. I mean, it was just amazing to, to think about. It is cool. I really like the logistics. I like the, both of it. I think that's why wedding planning and event planning in general sort of is very appealing to me. And similarly to the, um, my terrific team is that it feeds both sides of your brain, right? It gets the logistics and like the nitty gritty details because that's where events live or die as far as the success is in like all of the details and all the communication. But then getting that elevated event design and creativity and ha having that be the other part of our job is just really very fulfilling, if that makes sense. And then add on top of it, the client relationships are very special and getting to support people on the most amazing event days of their life. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just the best job in the world. We really like live in gratitude for getting to do it. So I've been to a couple events that you put on. Mm -hmm. um, I can think of two. I'll talk about one was um, um, a friend's wedding that I went mm -hmm. to. You were the, um, I don't want to say her name because you know, you know, you never know how like, people okay, yeah. people want, you know, they're they're mm -hmm. well, you know who I'm talking about. I know you're talking about. And <laughs> I was I was very impressed because I feel like I've been to a wedding at that place before and it was trash. And what you had done was was a lot different. And the logistics aspect was very like communicated well, mm -hmm. it flowed well. Like you was like, oh, go here, go there. Oh, there's a little bit of a, a bottleneck here. You guys should go over here. There's a full other thing. And like, you were yeah. really coordinating with that. And I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that's cool. Like now I get why, you know, weddings don't have to suck. Great. Like I think. Thank you, um, Thank you. <laughs> so, um, um, I, I think that what you just ex said is um, a huge part of why as a company we've been successful. It's because um, we've all been to bad events, right? Like we've all been to, and not just weddings, but maybe it's, maybe it's your like corporate Christmas party and they put you on the boat and you hate half the people there and you just want to get off the boat, but you can't because you're like down the river, right? Like there are a lot of things that can make an event feel bad. And we really try to focus on what those are um, and address them. So Hospitality is super important to us in the way that you we approach um, on-site event production and the way that it feels. So our event assistants, um, when they arrive, their job is set up in details and making sure everything is perfect, perfect. But obviously that is all done before the guests arrive. And then their job description literally changes to be forward facing towards the guests. So like if you can picture just arriving to any event space, sometimes that um, just arrival has a feeling of nervousness because where am I going and am I wearing the right thing? You know, like all of those things that start to make you feel nervous. So instead of a sign, we like to put, you know, a lovely girl in 
a black dress out front to say, hi, right this way, you know, ceremony is right in this direction. And I think it answers questions before they can be asked. I think it um, makes people feel really warm and welcomed and kind of just immediately eases that those initial like questions of like, where should I be and where am I going? And so throughout the night, that's what our event um, assistants do. They have a whole checklist of things that they are going through to make sure that the, um, the cocktail tables are for sure being cleared and the lights are dimmed after dancing. So your dance party after dinner, I'm sorry, so that the dance party can take off. That, that is, that is such a big thing. And I'm, I just, it makes me <laughs> crazy when you're at a wedding reception and it's just like, no one's dancing because it's so bright out. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, oh, oh, that just makes me crazy. Yeah. So, um, is that why people don't dance at parties because of the lights? Turn them down, babe. Turn them down. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Well, yeah. So I think that that is a really, it's, I know that it's a priority and a focus for us is that, you know, our event lead is taking care of uh, our client and their families. And then she's calling timing as the event goes on. But the event assistant is really focused on how the guests are experiencing the event and stays sort of in front of like any of those problems to make them smooth and comfortable and transitions really clear and easy. Um, and then that's how we constantly get referral business is because those people are guests at the event and then they call us later because they've experienced what it feels like to be um, at one of our weddings or our events. And it has really helped us grow and it's been really the basis of how we've built the business throughout the years. Do you remember your first client or you like one of your first clients? Um, first wedding or first like have your hostess client because it was a couple years before I got a wedding. But yes, I remember both. Okay, so so then, what made you get into weddings then, and what was your first client then? Like, what made you realize that oh, maybe I should do this? Well, next yeah, time? And, yeah, and I want I have a that was my one of my questions as well. Like, are you have you always been like a checklist type of person that mm -hmm. like just that's just how your brain is, and you knew that event planning was was going to be your path. Um, okay. So I went to school for psychology and, um, I wanted to be a psychologist. And my dad was like, you're going to work in a restaurant. And I was like, I'm going to be a psychologist. And then I didn't want to go to grad school at the time. I just wasn't ready to like immediately go to grad school. So I worked in a restaurant. <laughs> Where, did you live here? At yeah, a I, lived in DC. I lived in DC. You did. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Anyway, so I happened to really enjoy that job and um, I moved into management, but like during the time that I worked there, I, um, that company didn't do a lot of events, but what they did do were super private, like in home, cause they weren't a catering company. They were like a nice restaurant. So it would be like this chef would fly down from Boston and there was a person in like a PR position in DC. And I would talk myself into all of these. So we would go to somebody's beautiful house in Georgetown. And they, these two people from this company taught me so much about hospitality. And I really fell in love with that. And that was sort of the beginning of um, the journey for me. And then um, I did end up burning out in that restaurant. It was, it's tough. That's a tough job. Um, and so I tried to get like a normal, <laughs> business job. I worked uh, nine to five for like two years before I met my husband and um, he took me away with the Navy to Guam for a couple years. But um, eventually we came back and I had a couple kids and then um, this is really the whole story. I don't know if you need the whole story, but now we're living in Virginia Beach and uh, my kids were in preschool a couple days a week and I was anxious to go back to work. Uh, Gary was a helicopter pilot and he was in a deployment cycle at that same time. So it was hard for me to get a full-time job and really go back to work full-time. So I just said, it's fine. I am ready to start Happier Hostess and we're going to start it now and just grow it as the kids grow and see, you know, how it works. And then it worked. <laughs> so 10 years later, you know, flash forward, we're a professional event planning company and it's all working. It's working. That's that was awesome. how it started. And then this is the fun story. So the day that I like launched the company, because in 2013, you could launch a company by putting up a Facebook page, right? And so, <laughs> right? Good. So here's me. I like have this Facebook page and I put it out and then I felt like 
sick, like refreshing, refreshing. You just feel like vulnerable and, you know, and then I uh, obviously my cell phone numbers on there. And it was the same day later in the afternoon. I remember it so clearly. Uh, Gary was home early from work for some reason. And my phone rang and I answered it like, hello, like it's going to be my mom or something. Right. And this woman says, hi, is this the happier hostess? And I was like, this, this is the happier hostess. <laughs> And she said, hi, I saw your website. And like, it's just a Facebook page at this point, right? And I am hosting a baby shower this Saturday. And I sent out the invitations, but I haven't been feeling very well. And I just really need help pulling it together between now and Saturday. And within an hour, I was over at her house for a consultation. And I had my first actual event five days later. So, Look at that. Facebook that making the, you know, without Facebook, I mean, have nothing. <laughs> that's that's a cool story, though. Yeah, that was cool. Wow. It was just like a weird validation, I think, that like, hey, maybe it could work. So that's when being on Facebook was still fun. Yeah. Right. Right. You mentioned restaurants and hating that aspect of it. I, I Tim, you never worked in a restaurant, right? I can't remember. That was my first job growing up as a as a kid. Yeah. As okay. A well, I, I love as it. Well, started as a dishwasher, but then yeah. Both the worst. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you did not, at, towards the end, Carrie, you were like over it. You didn't want to, you was, burned out. It was just hard as management. I was young. I was 24 years old, 23, 24, working around the clock. I didn't have enough of a life. Like it just was not, it wasn't a good match for, I'd had enough. <laughs> so what's the yeah. difference between a restaurant and what you're doing now in hospitality? And how, how do you look at those things as you know, different? I, I think that there's, um, I mean, I think I have a much bigger passion for what I'm doing now, maybe than what I was doing then. I, um, this is going to sound dumb, but I think we all have these like breaking point moments. And I think I knew that there was just this moment where it was like the third time French fries had come back cold. And the third time I had to like walk under the line and be like, the French fries are cold. And I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, <laughs> like I need to be in a space where I have a little bit more control over how, um, I don't know. It's nice to it's nice to, I mean, it's nice to own the company and have um, say in the direction that we go in and, and who works here and, you know, be really um, passionate about the people that um, do this work here in this office every day are all so smart and, you know, I couldn't do it without them for sure. So I don't know, did that answer the question? Yeah, it does for me. And I, yeah, I am, I'm curious, you being so detail oriented, mm -hmm. what, what do, what platform do you use for task management, uh, project management? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, uh, client facing, we are really into Google drive. We have Google drive and folders and, um, all kinds of things that live in our shared client Google drive. Um, behind the scenes um, in our office is Trello. So we have a Trello board for every single client with um, tasking and in office communication, and that keeps us straight. That's our, those are our two main like task oriented um, platforms. We tried Asana. Do you, what do you use? Do you guys use any of those? I think you use um, Notion. Don't you use Notion? I use Notion. Yeah, Notion. We're, we're big on Notion. Yeah. We tried to sign it. You know, I think sometimes it's good to like try a different one because that one we weren't, we just weren't using as much. And um, one of the girls here was like, I did some research. We're going to try this switch. And it worked really well. So. Yeah. We use Trello for a little while as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we do with, with if like if certain clients use that, then we'll, we'll use it as well. Mm -hmm. But notion is, is my go-to, but you, I mean, cause you have to, you definitely have to do something there. I mean, especially events like what you're working with, that is just so many, mm -hmm. it's a lot of details and a lot of moving parts. When yeah. we were doing a lot of events, we used Basecamp. And I, oh, yeah. I don't recall if it was good, bad or ugly, but I think it was efficient enough to get right. things going. And, um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts in that, you know, with the, a team similar size to, to what you have, Carrie. And it's just like, you know, I guess you got to have all that stuff. We've had corporate clients who use Basecamp who have like added us onto that. And I think that's another effective tool. I agree. You know, it's just, I think sometimes it's just the reason we don't Trello client facing is because it's just another thing for them to learn. 
Right, right. And we're here for service, not for, you know, I don't want them to have to like strain. <laughs> well, it's, it's just- Google's easy. Google's easy. Mm -hmm. It is just so important. Like even today, today I was uh, writing a blog post and they were a previous guest on the third and four show. So I wanted to do some cross-linking. So mm -hmm. I go into Notion, able to, to grab those links if they were put in there so that I can just copy and paste links. But I mean, so it's just like, you, you never know when you need to go back to find that type of information, even a year after the fact. It's uh, So were the links put in there? Cause I mean, that, that response makes it seem like they weren't put in there. Oh, there's the answer. <laughs> All right. They were not, but. Uh, <laughs> well, in theory it's supposed to work if it was done correctly. But... It's uh, the, it's the, the, the after action stuff I, I would have is always the most most difficult aspect of it because it's I, I would assume that that's probably the case for you because you're oh. already moving on to the very next thing. Oh my gosh, way to hit my Achilles heel on this podcast. I um, I suffer from being bad at offboarding. I never mean it. I just have a really hard time like after the event, like I can like desperately miss those people, but it is so hard because the next one's coming at me fast. And, um, we talk a lot about how to get better at it and, um, it's tough. It's hard. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that's one of the yeah. things that, uh, that, from a team standpoint that we talk about a lot is like, is reducing the number of dependencies so that mm -hmm. when one thing, like, just like we were talking about with branding, you change the branding and you got to change the website. You have to change the letterhead. You have to change your social media. You have to change. There's all these changes that is a domino effect. So it's like, I, I always try to think about how do we do things in a way that reduces the number of dependencies so that you don't miss things later down the road. It, it's, it's really, really complicated. How long did your rebrand take you, Tim? Well, we're still going through it right now. So we haven't even updated the website yet. And it's, and it's one of those things where like, Coming up, just this like the logo aspect of it is mm -hmm. just so painful for me uh, because it's just that's two and a half every, months, every, right? Everything has already been done before. I mean, yeah. it's just like so to come up with something unique and original is just like it's it's, it's just it's not possible. Whereas, gosh, I think that it's great from your standpoint. I think that people are like trained in their brain, like, hey, I saw this wedding and I want to do exactly that, and it's okay. It, you know, it's like you, it's just you would people are encouraged to do that and and get ideas and i'm sure that you probably spend more time on pinterest than anybody just uh yeah, looking at different you know, we don't spend any time on pinterest it's like a the only time we're on pinterest is if somebody sends us their pinterest board yeah and that's what i was that's what i meant i'm sure the people are sending you pinterest boards like yeah. crazy that this is what i want yeah Good old Pinterest. That's where I found yeah. my uh, engagement ring because my <laughs> wife had put it on there and I took it to uh, <laughs> to uh, Chris Lyons from Adele Diamond. And I said, this is it. And he said, all right, well, we're going to have to make it. And I said, all right, mm. I guess you're going to have to. <laughs> um, March 2020 hits and Oof. the world ends. You're in a trajectory that's going great. Mm -hmm. Things are going well. Packed houses. Yeah. A lot of weddings on the calendar and then every single uh you know um political person in the world medical professional says you can't see anyone yeah how like when you first heard that what were the thoughts like was it like just like this deep loss how did you get through it like what because you're smiling today and it's I, we July made it 2023 yeah uh, the company, at least I, um, okay. So it was just busy. It is really what it was for us because, um, we care so much about the people, um, and the success of their events that what we were dealing with was an enormous amount of emotion. And so it was a lot a lot of phone calls, you know, and, and sometimes the important thing was like, as soon as it, as soon as something changed and we knew that that affected this, now this set of events, it was like the fact that I needed to reach out to this person, like with comfort and solutions and a strong like voice before they could start to lose it because it just was so emotional. And um, so for us, it didn't feel like a void or a suck. It just felt 
extraordinarily busy. Um, just a lot more like hand holding and then change this and change it all again and communicate it all again. So in that, in those immediate days, those first days, um, just like anything else in business, like we just immediately tried to streamline as much as we could. We created templates for communication logs for, you know, event and parameters and who, which vendors we've talked to, what days they're available, you know, as we're moving things and, and what, and we're reading contracts and it was just mitigating and communicating and um, yeah, like I. Well, it's only of, supposed to be two weeks to start, you know, a couple of weeks if, I don't know how the care came up with that number, but I don't know. But that was so smart on your part to yeah. utilize that time to establish those procedures and steps. Yeah. So I don't know. We got through it. It was it was really hard. And um, I don't know. We learned a lot. Uh, there was obviously some downtime even for us in the middle there where um, I was able to work on the business instead of in the business or like sometimes I get that wrong, the on and in, but you know what I mean? Right. Right. Um, and so. I think you said it right. Okay. We're <laughs> yeah. in the business, not in on, the business. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there's a real beauty in that. And, you know, I think I made some progress as far as the company itself and, you know, cleaning some things up that probably needed, it was time for a review of. So that was great. I also happened to book some outstanding clients, like full service clients at that time. So, you know, we plan a year out. So nobody was expecting it to mm -hmm. us to be talking about it in a year. So we were still doing some outstanding event planning in real time for future events, if that makes sense. So, yeah. It, so you bring up a really interesting point. I'm sorry, you go ahead and finish. I'll remember. No, that's okay. I mean, I just think sometimes people thought like everything came to a total halt. It just never really did because we planned for, we planned future, right? So yeah. it did as far as like what I'm doing this Saturday, what I'm doing next Saturday. And like, that was a messy mess. But like, there were a lot of things that stayed on track at the same time. Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, um, just in the sense of like what you do is, is that it's very like once in a lifetime kind of thing, or just, it's, it's, it doesn't happen very often. What, what steps do you put in place so that you can keep your clients, um, not, not transactional, but you know, so mm -hmm. that you can get reoccurring. So how do you maintain that communication? So it goes from a wedding that, all right, now I'm going to call Carrie because we're doing the baby shower and right. then the next baby shower, you know, do you have procedures in place or you're, mm -hmm. That should probably be Is that on the to-do list? I don't know, right? Can we put that on the to-do list? I don't know. I mean, the thing is, uh, we are very lucky in that we have a number of people and always have who have younger daughters. And so we have some very special, like favorite families that we are currently planning their second daughter's wedding, right? So it feels very uh, comforting to work with them again and we're just so glad to be back in that kind of conversation and space with um, these people. So I think that's something um, cousins, you know, like bridesmaids, like we do see these frequently see people again. I don't think I have a great like solid answer yeah. to that question though. I mean, it's nice. Instagram's nice. You can keep up with people's lives. It's nice to watch the babies come and, you know, and cheer them all on from where we are. We try to keep in touch as much as we can, but you know, life yeah. <laughs> life is a wild ride, right? It goes so fast. It is. And I suppose uh, that probably uh, real estate agents are probably in the same thing, whereas mm -hmm. I think that you, know, you, you move on what average seven, every seven years or something like that. But yeah, you know, I mean, something that we are sort of proud of is that we haven't paid for advertising. So really from the beginning, it's been word of mouth referrals and um, so that has really kept us like attached in some way to a lot of people that we know. Um, and you know, a lot of that is venues as well, you know, from being on the perfect vendor list at all the top venues in town, like that is really like a referral source that we are like live and die by. But, but those like personal referrals are special to us, um, and have really, grown our business. Um, and really like the level of clientele has grown with those business referrals as well. You know, this person. Yeah, how, 
Yeah. How does that work with with a higher end client that you're going after? You can't you can't really market them during the event. That's kind of cheesy and probably <laughs> taboo kind of thing. So how do you how do you make that touch point without being super overt that you're trying to make that touch point? I mean, look. <laughs> Oh, is this, the, is this the secret sauce? Ooh, she'll tell us after we like, stop. Sometimes being charming can get you, can help you get away with stuff. You know, yeah. like, I mean, this is, this is the truth. Like, I can be at a wedding on somebody's private farm, and I promise you, some bridesmaid will come up to me and be like, "That's your next girl." And if you think I'm not going to like smile, oh, for sure, and, like, say hi to that girl, right? Like, yeah. so. I have a lot of support around me all the time, you know, whether hey, real, real close attention, whoever catches that bouquet of flowers, whatever okay. they call that. Uh... We, we are one of those girls that I said, we're doing the second. I hope she ever sees this because she knows we've talked about this a million times, but um, we did the older sister and she tossed that bouquet and the um, younger daughter caught it. I like walked straight over to the mom and I said, um, your new Google Drive has been created already. <laughs> like, couldn't be happier for the next wedding. Is that put, put the, make the make the down payment today to right. save five percent. Exactly, uh, exactly. Cool. Yeah. So I don't know. Sometimes you have to ask for it. I also, um, in business, am really never afraid of saying what I want. I think it's important to say if there if I know that someone is engaged and that they don't have a planner, like I'm not. I don't, I think it's fine to at some point yeah. go up and squeeze their arm and be like, I'd love to talk well, to you. And, like, and that's exactly what I, I love what, to with you. Right. That's right. Because, right. And, and asking these questions is really not to try to get the secret sauce for you to, to share your secrets, but it's for the right. listeners out there yeah. because so many people are afraid to sell. And it's like, if you're solving someone's problem, you're right. solving that pain point, you're doing them a disservice by not telling them that you have what it is that they need. Right. So it's just, you have to be, well, it's like Probably you gotta listen, right, that. and hear what someone's saying. Yeah. I was at lunch with someone. Sure. Yesterday. I was at lunch with someone yesterday, and something came up that was clearly a problem. And I was like, "Well, how do you anticipate solving that?" Yeah, I can clearly be that person. Mm -hmm. And now there's another meeting set up to discuss kind of the higher logistics aspects of mm -hmm. that. And it's like you also have to listen in there, right? Where it's not just be, like that listening aspect and really understanding what someone's saying at the right time to then go in there and be like, "Ah, oh, I am going yeah. to." you know, start yeah. that Google drive. It, it, it's, it, it makes me think of uh, Kenya knocking on people's car doors that had dirty cars as he's trying to get his detail, auto detailing business going. I mean, it's just, you see yeah. a problem, yeah. you can solve it, make it happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and in all sales, like sometimes you just have to say it, you have to say what you want. You have to end the call with saying, if you, you know, if it's someone that I am having a great chat with, like you better believe before I get off the call, I'm going to say, I would really like to work with you. You know, like I feel I like what's happening here right. and I would really like for it to be us because I yeah, tell, the, the intentions are no. right. I, I, I tell founders that all the time. It's just lean mm -hmm. into that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. People want to help you. And if you don't tell them what you need or how you can be helped, then they'll never know how they can help. I mean, it's right. just, it's so amazing how people respond when you tell them. Right. Yeah. So for the first significant amount of the business 60 70 maybe even 80 percent of the business you work from home oh yeah we did my house multiple right. people lots of people yeah in and yeah. out yeah i remember hearing the stories and then yeah. you said i guess it was oh, enough my... enough like why did you get the office how'd you do it you did yeah. do the office during covid too like no. it wasn't it was one year ago so 20 may well, 20 technically you know there's still talk about the vid so you never know you know coco right. is still around depending on who you listen to but so how did the whole thing come about? Great question. So we did, we worked from my house forever. It was just me for a long time. And then I had my first full-time employee and I put an extra desk in, right? So we kind of took over that, like what would be like the formal living and dining space in somebody's house. Um, and then I had a second full-time employee and we literally put in another desk. And then um, there was still sort of like a dining room table that we used as like a conference table. So that worked really well when we needed to come together. But um, then we had a third full-time employee and it was literally like not enough places for people to be. And at any given time, someone was out on my kitchen table on a zoom or a phone call and like, you know, 
I'd be like in the backyard, like at the table, like trying to get like quiet if it was like something like more sensitive that I didn't want anyone to overhear. So it just became like not, it just didn't work. We needed to get out of there. And, you know, I think we needed to get out of there for our own sense of pride a little bit, you know, like it wasn't working anymore to be running this company that was like, you know, producing these (laughs) enormous events for people to just be happening as we're sitting on top of one another in my dining room, you know? So, um, we started to look around and, you know, I had a bunch of parameters and, um, we found this office after searching for, it took a couple of months. Um, but we moved in in May and, you know, wedding season is May, June. So it took us a long time to get around to like finishing it. You know, it was like, we got, well, everybody's, thanks so much. Yeah. We got everybody's offices, like office furniture. And then it, we kind of just like what happened out there was just um, pretty blank until we could give it some more attention later in the year, but it looks good now. Thanks. So, so on the track of investing into your business, yeah, you were, yeah. you were in Paris mm-hmm. last week. It was, w- was that a, was that a tough decision to say, Hey, I want to invest in my business. I want to go to Paris or was it a good excuse? And what did you learn when you were there? So um, I uh, have always, you know, like, not that this is necessarily unusual, but I have always been really invested in ongoing education. I have never been afraid to hire a mentor when I needed to make the next step. Um, So um, I feel as though the people who I'd really like to learn from are the people who are like at the top of the market. Like I really, I want to learn from those like top five planners. Um, I want to see what they're doing that I'm not doing. And it is hard because there is a level of wedding education, wedding planning education that exists, but it's all entry level. And frankly, a lot of it's predatory, but that's another conversation, but there is not really an advanced, like how to get your business from here to here in this luxury event market. Um, that doesn't like exist necessarily, or it didn't until like somebody actually did do it just recently. But so there is a conference, um, for, luxury event planners and it is expensive and it's amazing and it's a full investment. And I kind of threw it in, like, this is where I need to be. And I, I have conversations with a good friend who also attends that it is important to be in the room, like be in the room with those people, be a part of the conversation, be listening, (laughs) obviously a lot more than you're ever talking, but, um, just to be seen and heard and pick up those nuggets like as they come. And it's been really um, has had a period of a lot of growth for me since I started going. And the last one was just last week in Paris and it was terrific. I learned so much. Yeah. There is something I've I've said this for probably a decade, Tim, you've probably Mm -hmm. heard me say it, Carrie, I don't know if you ever have, but there's like, when you have certain advice, Like go Mm -hmm. to the people who have done that before, Mm -hmm. you know, don't go to business advice and ask your dentist, Mm -hmm. right? Ask your dentist to work on your teeth to make sure they're good. Right. And so to, to look at these people, you know, I want to be a professional football player. Well, you know, go talk to a professional football player. There's probably one in your Mm -hmm. city You're at some point there is right. You know, whatever that thing is, go talk to the person who's actually been there. They'll give you some sort of advice. And then you can, after having that conversation, figure out, well, maybe they can give me more advice or maybe it's someone else that needs to give it to you. But it's like, there is something that's very important. And I've always appreciated that aspect of you because, because you've always said that for the years that I've known you is Mm -hmm. like, I want to, I want to learn from the people that have been there before, Mm -hmm. not just, you know, some random schmo who, who, who doesn't Mm -hmm. necessarily know this industry. And it's cool that you've been able to continue to, to do that. Yeah. Well, then to take it one step further, if you were there and someone was like, hey, Carrie, we have the event for you. Somebody wants to do it at Virginia Beach. You then stepping up and saying, yep, I'm going to take the job no matter what. And you'll figure it out. Not worry about all the things that may or could go wrong or that you haven't done it. But just it's my time to take the shot. Yeah. And then, right. I fully agree on all. And then, you know, as we grow and try new things and I need those kinds of connections to be the people to ask questions of, right? Like when I am worried about like what load the tent can, this kind of tent can handle for this rig that I'm hanging over the dance floor. Like I need to know who to call, 
right? Like I need to have contacts and, um, you know, it's all, it's all a part of the growth process. So getting in the room is the best way to get it started. That's what I think. I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, and what is, I, I, what is the quote, Zach? We both read the book, uh, Matthew McConaughey, uh, right. you know, walk in, walk, right. yeah. Walk in like you own the place, not like you're looking to buy it. Uh, oh. makes, a, makes a big difference as well. I did yeah. read that twice and I remember that. There's many yeah. scenes in that book that I remember, though. Some PG, <laughs> some not. <laughs> I love that book. It was, it was good. Uh, good yeah. book. It was good. Kevin Hart has a third book coming out, Tim. I just saw that. Mm. <clears throat> I think we talked about that recently. Um, yeah. I, I I guess my last thing is the hiring aspect of, of what you've done over the years. Yeah. Like, is that, and teaching them how to be obsessed with, you know, the event culture and stuff like that. Like, is that, how has that gone for you? you no, know, that's like such a great question. Um, so I, uh, I think I kind of referenced it when I was saying that, that there's like a predatory nature to, intro to event planning. I think that as a, there are a lot of people who want to be wedding planners on this planet. There are just a lot of girls, guys who find that to be very appealing. Obviously that makes sense to me. Um, and unfortunately there, this is not a occupation with proper regulation. So anybody can just decide to be an event planner, but then you have to figure it out on their own. There just are very few companies that are actually a place that you can get a job as an event planner and learn how to do it through them. So I hiring and creating jobs has always been like another really important like aspect of this company to me. I have always wanted to have a company that's big enough that I can hire people who are intelligent and passionate and dynamic, um, just like whip smart and like care about people who want to do this and be able to teach them how to do it super duper well and have that kind of reputation for having a team of people who just kill it every weekend. So that has always been like a place that I've started um, as far as how I wanted Happier Hostess to be. And then the actual hiring itself has been a place where I've I have won and lost, right? Like I've learned a lot about that. I think that um, the managing people aspect of it is always, I don't know. It's like what I spend most of my podcast on. Like, you know, like like leadership. Welcome is, to the club. I mean, that's, that's yeah. <laughs> people one-on-one. It's hard. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard. So um, I think in one way I've been extremely lucky in that when I have been hiring, I get so many resumes that um, I have been able to really end up with I mean, Laura and Ariel who work here full time and have for years are smart and amazing and like give it all. And so in that sense, I haven't had to teach anyone to be obsessed with it because they that's like predetermined. Right. Um, but, you know, I have had different timing in my career for letting people go. And you know what's funny, Zach, I think you were at my house one time when I let somebody go. Do you remember that? I wasn't you listening stopped, in on your conversations. You would stop by to see my husband. And I was like a little like hot, like, okay, I'm going to go do it. You know, those I moments. Remember, I was just time. trying and to like. An event assistant. But, um, you know, I think that that was one that I kind of did very quickly because I saw it as maybe not a good fit and didn't see it as something that could be necessarily. Surprisingly, was usually the person who is being let go was just like, toodles. Whatever. <laughs> Yeah. And we're, we yeah. as like, the business owners are like mm -hmm. so worried and concerned about it and overthinking every aspect of it. And they're just like, peace. Mm -hmm. Don't forget right. to pay me. Don't let the yeah. door hit you on the whatever. It's like, yeah. So, so, it's so it's hit you with a good load, split yeah. you. That one was good. And I've had other people that I've probably kept around longer than, you know, just to like out of loyalty. And I don't know. I've learned, I've learned a lot, you know, and um, you got to just do it. That's the, that'll continue. Yeah. <laughs> that'll, I'm sure, be a continued growth process. All right. Tim? We're, yeah, we'll swing. We'll, we'll, I want to finish up on the ups, uh, yes. uh, on the way yeah, up versus okay. uh, firing people. What, <laughs> what, so we are in August, the uh, wedding season. I don't know if it, we're midway through or if it's. No, we're in it. We're in uh, it. Yeah, so like, what are the trends right now? Like what, what's, what, what's the big thing that everyone's doing? Okay. So um, definitely like 
dance floor wraps are really big. So not just doing like a plain white dance floor, doing like a vinyl wrap with some kind of pattern on it um, is definitely um, coming into a lot more of our event spaces. Um, pattern in general, like patterns on the bars, um, more uh, color is coming into a lot of the flowers. For a long time, we had a lot of white and greens and we have a lot more colorful color palettes coming up in this next uh, year or so. And I think like unusual lighting. Um, and I think that there was like a little bit of a trend for the last couple of years for like pub food as fancy food, if you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. a lot of like fancy taco so stations, but I think that we're gonna start trending more into um, some more formal like elevated food. Um, who, who sets these trends? Is it the people or is it the industry? I mean, it's big bridal, whatever that is, right? Whoever that is behind the <laughs> curtain. Pulling the strings. It's wild. Yeah. Well, yeah. Kira, we appreciate your time. It's been absolutely okay. wonderful learning about the journey, relearning about the journey, walking yeah. through some of it with you. And um, we appreciate your time. You guys can check Carrie mm -hmm. and the Happy Hour Hostess out. Thank you. Happyhourhostess.com. Dot com. Thanks to both of you, Tim, Zach. Yeah. I super appreciate you having me and uh, love everything that you guys do. You do a lot for the community and um, you know, to spread support. And I just am really grateful to be here. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. We did it.